All right, good afternoon. Welcome to this month's uh, Interior Museum Lunchtime Lecture Series. My name is Diana Ziegler. I'm the director of the Interior Museum, and it's my pleasure to welcome you today. So today's lecture, we are celebrating the centennial of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918, uh, which implemented the 1916 convention between the US and Great Britain on behalf of Canada for the protection of migratory birds. The statute makes illegal the pursue, uh, the hunt and um, taking, capturing, killing, and selling of over 800 species of migratory birds without a waiver from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, since 1918, Mexico, Japan, and Russia have been incorporated into the Mer Migratory Bird and Treaty Act. Uh, here at the Interior Museum, our lunchtime lecture serve, series serves as a, kind of a gateway into all of the various uh, missions of the bureaus of the Department of the Interior. Uh, one of the things that I particularly enjoy highlighting is our global reach, the global reach of the Department of the Interior. It's rather um, an oxymoron, <laughs> if you will, but uh, so much of what we do here spans geo and um, geospatial boundaries and uh, really affects the world as a whole and nothing really can um, epitomize that as much as the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Uh, I'm pleased to be welcoming Dr. Elena, uh, Elena Babici. Uh, she's been with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service since 1996, where she has served as the general bio biologist with the Division of Threatened and Endangered Species, the Division of Scientific Authority, International Affairs, and Division of Environmental Contaminants. Uh, she's currently the Wildlife Biologist and Climate Change Coordinator in the Division of Migratory Bird Management. Uh, she has a Bachelor of Science in Natural Resource Studies and Master of Regional Planning and Environmental Planning from the University of Massachusetts and a PhD in Environmental Science and Policy Program uh, from George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, please welcome Elena. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I think climate change is an extremely important issue um, that we're facing right now. And I'm really happy to be here to talk to you a little bit about climate change in general and some of the impacts that we're seeing on some of our migratory species. So um, my talk today um, will cover a number of things. Um, the first is uh, just a basic understanding of what climate change is. Um, what are some of the changes that we're seeing? Um, how are these affecting some of our migratory species? And I wanted to end it with um, talking a little bit about what we can do. Um, it's a very overwhelming issue um, that scares a lot of people. I mean, it's a huge elephant in the room. And so I think that, you know, a lot of people feel like there's not a lot that they can do to make a change, but there really is. So I wanted to kind of close out the discussion with, with what some of those things are. <clears throat> the first thing, I, I know this seems very simple, but um, I wanted to cover what the difference between weather and climate um, actually is. I talked to a lot of people who kind of confuse the two issues. And they think that, you know, they look at what's happening out, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis and they say, well, you know, we can't be having climate change. Look at, you know, what's going on here. It's summertime. It's really cool. You know, how can they say that we're having climate change issues? But um, there's really a big difference between uh, weather and what we know as climate. And weather is kind of what we see now. So it's, you know, sunny out, it's hot, it's humid, it's foggy, it's rainy. Um, it's kind of um, variable. It occurs in a, a, you know, limited area. And as many of us know that try to listen to the forecasts um, to plan out our weekends, it's really difficult to predict. <clears throat> On the other hand, climate, and when we talk about climate change, it's actually 
something that's measured over long uh, spans of time. It's seasonal changes, and the best way to think about it, it is climate is really what we expect. It's something, you know, as we think in the future that, you know, the summer is going to be like this. So it's kind of long term and it's a it's a series of averages of what our weather is. So they're two very different things. So really what changes are we seeing? You know, one of the things, too, as I talk to people is that um, in many cases, people think that climate change is something that's going to happen in the future. That, and, and in some cases, some people think, well, you know, I'll be long dead and gone before, you know, I'll see anything related to climate change. But climate change has been happening for quite some time. It's happening now. And we're really seeing the effects of climate change and happen for some time. Um, one of those things, and you you know you hear a lot about this in the news, and you read it in some of the you know newspaper reports, but um, we're seeing increases in um, CO2 in the atmosphere, and these measurements here were basically taken at the the Mauna Loa Observatory, and basically since uh, 1958, we've actually seen. Um, a 24% increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. <laughs> what we're also seeing is increasing temperatures. And um, as you can see from the chart, um, we've really seen kind of a sharp rise <clears throat> from about 1970 up to now. And um, in 2015, we had the uh, warmest temperatures on record since the 1880s. And in 2014, it was the second highest temperature. And since 2001, 15 of the 16 warmest years have occurred. So we anticipate that this is going to continue on and um, we'll see how 2016 falls out and whether that'll beat the record for 2015 and becomes our warmest on record. And kind of to stress the point about how this is happening for a long time, how many people are gardeners? Any gardeners? So I know I'm a gardener. And um, especially when I send away for different plants in the mail, I'll always check what is the plant hardiness zone. You know, what plants can I buy that are going to make it in my particular area? <clears throat> and many of you have probably looked at um, Department of Agriculture puts out these plant hardiness zone maps, which basically tell you and help guide you in terms of the plants that are going to survive in your area. And as you can see, they, they occasionally update these maps during specific years. And so you can see from here, there's a good comparison of two maps that they produced, one 1990 and the other in 2012. And you can see how <clears throat> The, the purplish dark zone is the coldest zone and how those temperatures, that's actually shrunk and it's a little bit warmer and some of those zones have kind of encroached in. So you can see how these temperatures have gradually increased over the years. Another thing that we're seeing is some extreme weather events and some of those are um, drought events, um, and flooding events. And many of you recall that um, last year, especially in California, we had um, a lot of drought. They were in kind of dire straits out there. And this year, we're seeing a lot of um, fire events that are occurring up in the tar sands area. I mean, those were phenomenal fires. So we're also seeing an increase in some of these extreme weather events. Also, um, we're seeing uh, sea level rise in certain areas. And one of the things that I wanted to stress about some of the things that we're seeing is that this is not uniform across you know, the globe or across, say, North America or the United States. It's variable. So you know, you'll have droughts in one area. You'll have you know, extreme flooding in another. Um, and the same is, is with the case with sea level rise. You don't have sea level 
rise just occurring all the same. Um, so what's happening in the East Coast is not necessarily the sea level rise you might see in the West. And actually here along the East Coast is considered a hot spot for sea level rise. We'll probably, as far as the United States, see more sea level rise than the rest of the U.S. <clears throat> Again, we're seeing changes in precipitation. So this map kind of shows you some of those areas where there's been really heavy rainfall events. And um, a lot of times I've been hearing things like, oh, you know, this is equivalent to a 50-year flood event. Well, those 50-year flood events are happening sooner than every 50 years. And so that's kind of the trend that we're seeing. Some of these, um, you know, these weather events are occurring more often than what we've seen in the past. And finally, <clears throat> I wanted to touch on ocean acidification and rising temperatures in our oceans. And oceans are great absorbers of carbon dioxide. And, um, you know, the temperatures are warming um, in those areas. And what we're seeing as um, temperatures rise, pH is being reduced, which is causing the oceans to become very acidic. And this causes a problem in a number of areas, um, one of which is all the, all the organisms that need to have calcified shells are having trouble because the waters are too acidic. So it, it's causing some problems there. And some of the corals, you hear a lot about coral bleaching from the warmer temperatures. And also with the higher um, acidic levels, a lot of the corals are having trouble kind of building the skeletons and also um, they have a symbiotic relationship with algae and the algae can't withstand the higher temperatures. So we're also seeing impacts in our oceans as well. And Yogi Bear probably put it the best where um, he, he stated that the future ain't what it used to be. And um, this is very true for us. I mean, conditions are changing. So what we expected um, in the past um, may not be what we're going to get in the future. So um, I think that the one thing that we can expect is that we're going to be surprised. And we're going to continue to see some of these changes and maybe an, at an accelerated rate. So what does this mean for migratory birds? <clears throat> One of the things that, you know, I wanted to stress is that migratory birds and really any migratory species really are faced with some very unique challenges. Um, many birds um, have, they migrate in the spring and the fall and they, many spend their winter in the southern hemisphere where there's more favorable conditions and more food but then when the spring comes, they'll migrate to the northern hemisphere into their breeding areas. Depending on the length or the roots that these species have, um, they, they could stop at many stopover sites along the way. So when you're dealing with changes that are recurring, whether it be extreme events where they run into storms when they're migrating or bad conditions on a stopover site, there's many places where migratory birds can be impacted by, by some of the changes that we're seeing. Um, and these changes will vary. Um, you can probably characterize birds in, in two general categories where we have short distance migrants. And this would be a, a bird such as the tree swallow. And you can see that in North America, down, um, they have their wintering area in the southern part of North America. And then they move up into the northern part of North America to breed. And they have a small area where there's a migratory route. Um, northern flickers are kind of the same way. It's considered a short distance migrant. And what we're finding is that a lot of these birds that don't have very far to go um, actually are able to cue a little bit better with changes in temperature and track those changes during their migration. When you compare that to, say, an Arctic tern, which is one of our longest distance migrants, um, 
you have a bird that probably lives to about 26 years in the wild and it migrates twice a year from pole to pole and so over the course of its lifetime it can probably it probably travels about 1 million kilometers and so um, obviously it's not getting a cue in terms of when to leave um, because it has no idea what the temperature is that's happening you know say in in the breeding area so it's very different and there's different um, challenges for long distance migrants than what you get with someone like say the tree swallow or northern flicker so um, how does climate change affect migratory birds and their habitat and and there's really basically two general ways um, one are through direct effects and those would be things such as temperature and precipitation um, there's also indirect effects so you can get habitat loss say from sea level rise you can get invasive species um, one of the things that climate change does is it magnifies other stressors and I had a colleague of mine that kind of termed climate change saying that it is the mother of all stressors because it just kind of pushes things so you know you've got these challenges for birds day to day and then you have climate change come in and it may be that um, it will increase um, disease and you can see that in some of our um, Hawaiian birds where there is um, avian malaria so a lot of times birds will avoid the mosquitoes they can go up in elevation and the mosquitoes can't go up that high because of uh, temperature restrictions but as temperatures are increasing the mosquitoes are moving up the mountain and they're impacting birds that they didn't impact before and exposing them to additional diseases that they never had before so those would be some of the indirect effects that we're seeing with climate change what we're seeing is um, there's changes in the spring arrival of birds <clears throat> in general um, egg laying is occurring earlier every every decade and that is occurring about 6.6 .6 days earlier um, every 10 years and going back to the example of the tree swallow um, they're now nesting about nine days earlier than they did about 30 years ago so we're seeing that migration times are shifting um, the earlier example some birds are migrating earlier in the spring um, and also conditions might be favorable where they're going where they don't need to leave as early as they used to to head back to their wintering grounds there there's still some food left temperatures good and so they're staying longer in their breeding area some birds are not migrating at all and um, this is very beneficial for birds in the sense that if they don't have to migrate and be exposed to some of the dangers that migration brings with it and they have the resources in one place they don't have to expend the energy that they might have in the past and we're seeing birds um, Rufus hummingbirds is one example where they have a wintering area in the southern part of Alabama and we're now seeing that they are year-round residents down there and Mexican green jays are um, starting to become year-round residents in Texas so we're seeing changes in the way um, in bird behavior because of, of changes in climate bird distributions in general are changing um, so we're having shifting ranges <clears throat> And we're also having shrinking ranges because birds are going to try to follow um, they're going to try to follow their ideal temperature and so we're seeing and this isn't just with birds we're actually seeing this with fish and other organisms um, and plants as well that a lot of plants are starting to shift northward um, and also as I had mentioned earlier um, 
species don't necessarily just migrate on a spatial level, but they also uh, migrate um, in elevation. So we're seeing, you know, some species that are moving higher up mountains and, you know, have a migration kind of in an up-down arena as well. A concern of that is that a lot of times when these species move, it may not be, although they're tracking ideal temperatures or better temperatures, they, <coughs> excuse me, they may be moving into unsuitable habitat. <clears throat> and so what may be occurring is that um, birds don't have the nesting material that they're used to. It, it just isn't there at the new sites that they're going. <clears throat> or you know, what they feed on isn't there. So they're maybe moving into suboptimal areas. Also, um, another concern is that, you know, a lot of the national wildlife refuges, a lot of the national parks have been established to protect a certain species. And so you may have um, a wildlife refuge that's there to protect a, a type of waterfowl. Um, a good example, it's a plant example, not a bird one, but a national park, you have Joshua Tree National Park. And as these plants, birds, mammals start to move, they're moving out of these protected areas into areas where they're not afforded the same protection as what they have right now. Um, <coughs> this is kind of a fun map that National Audubon put together which shows um, that as temperatures have increased since 1966, some of the movement of winter have, um, breeding or winter areas for certain species. And you can see that some of this northern migration is pretty significant. You've got <clears throat> the purple finch, which has moved 433 miles further north and um, pine siskins and fox sparrows have actually moved 288 miles further north. And as you can see from this, I mean, red-breasted mergansers, American robins, they look like they did a direct north route. But a lot of these species are moving, you know, northeast, northwest. It's, it's not necessarily a straight line. So what we're seeing is that ecological communities are basically being reshuffled. And, um, you know, so right now you may have an ecosystem where everything is in place. Uh, the bird knows where its nesting material is, the food is there, um, they know their competitors, they know, you know, the resources that are there, the disease and all that. But as things start to shift, Somebody goes here, the plants aren't moving as quickly, somebody else is moving over to the, to the west. And so <clears throat> you get to an area where all of a sudden you have a grouping of species you never had before. So you're dealing with novel communities. And so that's something that we're not quite sure what to expect there, but um, <clears throat> you know, when a bird goes into that situation, all of a sudden they're exposed to a lot of challenges. There may be additional predators there that they never had to deal with before. Um, they might be now compet uh, competing for a food source, competing for you know prime nesting area. They're being exposed to new diseases and parasites. And um, in many cases they could be moving into habitats that are less ideal. So they have to adapt to those situations. <coughs> what we're also seeing is that bird behavior and their environment is becoming mismatched. And this is especially true for those long distance migrants. Um, they're the ones that are most at risk. So if you think back to that tree swallow and northern flickers, they're close enough and their migration is short enough where Sometimes they can pick up on cues that are temperature and move with it. You have an Arctic tern <clears throat> or somebody like the red knot who um, doesn't have that temperature cue. And so their, their cue may be a change in day length. And all of a sudden they're up in their wintering ground and they're saying, hey, 
you know, the day, day shifting, their hormones kick in, it's time to move to the breeding area. So off they go. <clears throat> this is their traditional migration route, traditional migration time. They get to their breeding area, and if they, for example, eat insects, yeah, they time it for the most favor to get in to the most favorable conditions. And so they come in and they lay their eggs. They're getting ready to feed their young and lo and behold, the insects peaked two weeks earlier. So they have just now lost their food source and this really affects their survival capability and survival of young. So we're seeing a lot of that happening. Um, another, another example that's a little bit different is <clears throat> puffins up in Maine. Um, I had talked about the fact earlier that we're seeing a lot of our oceans warming as well. Fish are responding the same way that some of the other species are. So when <clears throat> the oceans get warm, What's happening, the fish are moving further north or they're going deeper. And so you have a species like a puffin, <clears throat> which comes into an area, they feed their young primarily hake and haddock. They can't get at hake and haddock anymore during those summers where it's really warm. So they've got to switch over to an alternative food source. And in the case of Maine in 2012, they moved to butterfish which is, you know, I guess good. They still have a food source. The problem was that the butterfish are so large that when they feed it to the young, the young can't swallow it, and so they starve. So we're seeing some of these mismatches occurring. Um, uh, MERS up in Hudson Bay, thick-billed MERS, they're a, a colonial nesting seabird. They come in, they establish these vast quantities of um, or vast uh, colonies and um, they start nesting but what's happening is they're coming in they have an adjusted timing to the best time to come in and they're being affected by heat and mosquitoes which is causing a lot of adult mortality as well as mortality for their for their eggs so um, there's there's a lot of things that are happening that haven't been adjusted to yet. Also, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about, you know, indirect effects and say habitat loss from say sea level rise. <clears throat> so the red knot is is in danger of losing a lot of its habitat up at the in the tundra. The the Arctic is really being impacted by climate change. So you've got areas that are um, in danger. Another is um, when you have some of these stopover habitats, um, I don't know how many folks are birders, watch the migrations. So you know, you know, a lot of people go to certain areas in the states during certain times of year because you know, you've got the migrants coming through and depending on how far they're going, <clears throat> they've just crossed an ocean or they've crossed these vast areas of land, they are spent, they're exhausted. A lot of times they'll just, you know, fall to the ground. They need resources, they need to refuel so they can continue on. And so a lot of these very important um, stopover, migratory stopover habitats, such as what we have in the Delaware Bay are, um, being challenged by sea level rise. And when you look at an area like the Delaware Bay, a problem is, is that there's, around that area, there's a lot of um, development. So there's not a lot of places for these birds to go. So you start to erode some of those areas and it's really gonna impact on those birds. So basically um, what we're seeing um, is that there are certain birds that have elevated climate risk, what we would call climate risk. And these, you know, obviously are the long distance migrants. Um, they just don't have the cues that some of the short term migrants might have. It's harder for them to vary their routines. Um, those species that might have 
poor dispersal ability um, or specialist species. They feed on a particular plant or a particular food source, which if they're moving to reach their ideal temperatures, their food source might not be. So if they are just dependent on that one food source, um, they, they could run into some trouble. Obviously, those with low population numbers to begin with, um, as I said earlier, the stresses are being magnified on them already. So if their population numbers are low or they have a poor conservation status to begin with, um, there's a good chance that a lot of those stressors are going to be um, even worse for them. So <clears throat> these are species that would be considered as high, having a higher risk um, to some of the impacts of climate change. Wanted to talk a, a little bit about the Migratory Bird Program and why this is important for the work that we do. <clears throat> and uh, one of the things that we work a lot with partners and other agencies, private individuals, um, and you know, we'll we'll work on bird conservation plans or other plans where we're you know focusing on a suite of species or a particular species. <clears throat> What's happening with climate change is that as we try to predict or when we're looking at what's happening to birds, those birds in some cases that we think are the highest priority may actually do a little bit better in the short run because of conditions. It may not, but some species that we're really not focused on right now say that it's a shorebird in an area where um, it, it has its breeding area um, along an area that's experiencing or will experience high levels of sea rise. All of a sudden, the status of that species may be one from, we don't really need to worry about it right now. There are other species that have more needs to, this gets to the top of the line. And with uh, limited resources, it's really, really important that we make sure that we take a look at this and we know that we're looking after those species that need the most help. Another thing that the Migratory Bird Program does is that we run um, harvest surveys. And so we have survey routes that we do a number of times during the year where we do, we do bird surveys. We get data, and a lot of this information is used for establishing, say, hunting regulations. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, we know, and there's been a couple of papers out that show that bird distributions are changing. So if we have set survey routes that we're flying to count certain birds, but those birds have shifted their migration routes, we're not getting good numbers. And so it's really, really important for us to be able to have the best data and to adjust um, our operations and to make sure that we consider climate change in our day-to-day -day operations. I wanted to kind of wrap up this talk with, um, you know, what can we do? Um, I have some friends who won't even talk to me about climate change. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to talk about it. It scares them. They feel that there's nothing I can do. There's nothing that can be done. It's too depressing. It scares me. Um, but in fact, there's actually quite a bit that we can do and probably most of the things you're already doing. And I just wanted to kind of go down some of those, those lists. You know, one is reduce your heating and cooling. You know, wear a sweater in the winter. Don't jack up your heat so high. Um, air conditioning, when you go out, you go to work, lower your thermostat. Um, drive less. If you happen to live in an area where you can commute to work by bicycle, do so. It's great, good exercise for you. Um, 
take Metro if you dare. <laughs> I know that that's not not the best right now, but um, you know if you can do alternative methods of transportation besides driving, do it. And if you do drive, carpool. Find out you know what colleagues are in the area. Um, can you drive to work? Um, meet up with folks at parking lots. Drive into work together. Cut down on some of the fossil fuels. When you go, you buy a new fridge, stove, washer, dryer. Make sure you look at the energy efficiency of it. I mean, it's kind of a no-brainer. I think people want to do that anyway because it saves you money. It's got a double benefit. Another is to conduct an energy audit at your house. Um, this is something that can go a long way. You can see kind of where um, some of the problems in your house are, where you're losing heat. Um, you can weatherproof your house. Again, it's something that would save you money in the long run. And it's something probably many of us already have done. Another is to conserve water. <clears throat> and this is extremely important and is going to be more important in the future. Um, a lot of what we're hearing and seeing is that in the winter time, we're not getting the snows up in the mountains that we used to. Um, snowfall is less. And in a lot of cases, that snow melt um, in the spring and summer is what feeds our streams and water bodies. And so as that decreases, we're going to be more strained. And when you're in an area like out west where there's already issues with water, it becomes extremely important. Um, you know, and, and this isn't something just in the U.S. either. We're seeing this globally and um, you know an example is in the Andes in South America <clears throat> the agriculture there is dependent on snow melt from the Andes and as that continues to dwindle um, they're going to be um, they're going to be hurting in terms of getting water supply for their agriculture so water use and protecting water use and, and being energy efficient with that is very, very important and will become more so as time goes on. Another, reduce, reuse, recycle. I'm sure many of us already do this. Um, <clears throat> towns, in a lot of cases, will provide <clears throat> separate vehicles or separate um, bins, excuse me, to recycle material. I know that my trash company does that. Take advantage of it. <clears throat> Definitely recycle. It's a good thing. <coughs> Support renewables. That's going to be critical because what we really need to do is reduce our carbon footprint and the amount of carbon that goes out into the year. Renewables is extremely important. On the more fun side, is go out and plant trees. Um, whether you do that in your garden, whether you do that if you're connected with Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, <clears throat> get involved with a deforestation project. Go out, have fun, plant some trees, enjoy the outside, the good weather. The other one I wanted to stress is to volunteer when you can. A lot of National Wildlife Refuges, I think National Parks as well, they look for volunteers. Um, a lot of the information that we get is based on citizen science. And so the more you volunteer, the more information that we'll have. And it helps the refuge. It's a lot of fun for you to get out there. <clears throat> and even if you didn't want to leave home, there are programs. I believe Cornell has one that's the Backyard uh, Bird Feeder Watch. And so what you can do, it, it starts, I believe, the beginning of January, and you can sit there and you um, note what birds come to your bird feeder. And you make a list of it and you report it to them. And I mean, this is critical because you'll, you'll actually start to see some of the changes of, you know, oh, you know, I'm getting such and such, 
And I never had that before. It usually came in February and it's January and they're now at my bird feeder or I'm not seeing this bird anymore which could be that the range is shrinking, it's, it's moving north. So a lot of this information is, is very important and um, it's good to get involved. And the last one I just wanted to touch on was to um, create wild, wildlife gardens. Um, as species start to move, they're going to need kind of refugia, some areas that are good to move into. And so the more areas that are friendly to them, the better. And the better uh, chances um, for them <clears throat> to be able to adapt. I know that a lot of uh, towns, and in some cases, I know National Wildlife Federation, I don't know if they still do it, but you could actually um, certify your garden as a, a wildlife um, area and get a certification and you know if you just wanted to garden look up the plants that you you know you you want to put in a certain area see what plants there are that are out there that will attract birds put those in you know butterflies whatever it might be um, so there are different ways that you can help there are a lot of fun so that, that's kind of the end of my talk, and I don't know if anyone has any questions.